got a great pleasure to introduce uh, Rick Shuttleworth. I've known Rick for a couple of years now. Um, Rick grew up in a hotbed of skill acquisition, which is in, over in Australia, particularly in AIS. Um, but he's more recently been working over in, in the UK with a number of UK sports, but probably more particularly rugby is, is what he's well known for. Um, again, Rick. Um, We'll have hundreds of, of, of probably examples to show you today and, and any time you talk to them again, always come away with great ideas that we can utilise. Um, last, time, last time Rick attended a motor skills conference, he uh, nearly tore his hamstring um, in some sort of games with, uh, with Damien Farrell and Marco Sullivan, so if we're, we're hoping not for any injuries tonight, fingers crossed. Oh, okay, um, just a reminder, after Rick's talk we're going to go into a couple of breakout sessions before lunch. Um, we're, again, we're able to take some of the, the information we've, we've got from Keith and from Rick and just interrogate it a little bit more. But without further ado, Rick Shuttleworth. Thanks for the invite. So I was really excited jumping on the plane. Um, it's an event that I just couldn't wait to get to, to be honest. I was really excited. So I'm really enjoying it. Hopefully this evening should be really fun meeting a lot of people. Um, I'm going to do a quick intro. Um, ecological dynamics in sport. Um, I'm just going to throw a couple of projects there I've been involved in more recently. One is a project of rugby development. Um, came over in 2013. And when I arrived here at um, RFU, I sort of looked at the system itself from within, and we try to improve performance. Um, Rob Andrew, myself, and Kevin Barry. And after a few days, I thought, where's the best place to go to? New Zealand. Have a look what's happening down there. Because I just wanted a trip. And the RFU have got money as well, so it was quite fortunate. So uh, there was a few coaches who were on the same page as sort of myself. Um, and uh, they really wanted to go to New Zealand as well. So, we all trucked down there. And I got my hands on this, actually. Um, try not to tweet it, please. <laughs> you can tweet other stuff, but not that. And, and the, <laughs> that, that, was, that was shared with me by a couple of people. And it was just sort of a high performance strategy document. But it's more than just that. Because if you look through it, you start to see stuff like, New Zealand has a proud tradition in shaping the way rugby is played. The tradition has been built on our ability to adapt quicker than any other country of the changing laws of the game through our enjoyment of the game. Don't tweet, please, anybody. <coughs> Coaching and player innovation, positive approach to change, and sharing of innovation and using of technology. I think, you know, I love to see that enjoyment at the top there. You, you, we noticed when we travelled there, uh, Super 16s, academies, schools, clubs, all enjoyed their rugby. They were all having fun. Um, things were done differently. Um, there's a great sharing of information between the coaches. Something that doesn't necessarily happen in England. We created the right environment to encourage information sharing and problem solving. When comparing ourselves to the rest of the world, our current practice of sharing information is a point of difference. We will continue to create opportunities for key people within our performance to come together along with external specialists. Our coaches were open to change and actively leveraged off the thinking of players. Our greatest sources of on-field innovation are coaches and players. Our coaches will proactively create environments that encourage players to share their views on how the game can be shaped and improved. And that was probably the, the biggest point of difference. When you watch the players at a higher skill level, do inhabit their environment. They are part of it. And, and they're tweaking things uh, to improve their own performances. And I think that's a product of what's actually happening through the pathway. Um, form of life, uh, there's some research by uh, Wittgenstein uh, and more recently uh, Martin Rothwell. And I've really jumped on this um, because that trip to New Zealand really unearthed um, a few findings. <laughs> this is a bit of a funny clip, so let's see if this actually works. 
Sure, and welcome to you, the rugby universe, to this international relations briefing on France. A brief but pretty accurate history. Now, these buggers have been up to all sorts of weird things for quite a while. What are they into? Revolutions, executions, explosions, perfume, frogs, snails, and creme brulee. It's also worth talking. <laughs> Style of play. Well, the, um, the observe, set face, middle of the track. Let's look at what the French were doing. 9 to 10. 10 was past the 13, 13 past the 15 coming into the line, 15 behind the back, pop past the 14, hit back on the angle, 14 to 10, 10 short ball to 11 on the inside, 11 cuts 12, 12 going to 10, 12 behind the back, pop past the 7, 7 in the contact fight, someone loses a testicle, 10 calls his wife, 14 sends a text to the girlfriend, 15 sends a text to 14's girlfriend, fight, French hooker scores. Now let's look at how the All Blacks would do it. We put a cut of the rugby thugger, rugby thugger, it's a chance to try. France and New Zealand, not built the same. England, we know your secrets. Observe, so anyone who's these fears keep wondering, we've never parted and pressed that gap. That's a space around here, which leaves this man on the other side. We'll come forward, we'll go back, we'll come back, we'll come forward. It doesn't know if we go over here, let's go here. <laughs> Pretty inaccurate description, actually, isn't it? Um, anyway, that's that. So that's the sort of form of life, I think, that comes through. But anyway, when we went around the country, we sort of summarised everything into the three C's. And um, the, the academy system and the pathway system had the three C's. And crumminess, like, there was nothing there that was pristine. There was nothing brand new. There was nothing. The paint was peeling off the walls in most of the academies, and the equipment is. is, is is suboptimal, um, and it was crowded. There was mixed school levels overlapping, coming in through different organisations, and, and, and they were sharing information. And the creativity was high as well. So we just generally came up with those three things. But in essence, with a form of life, what I tried to sort of develop with some of the coaches was um, some methodologies which help design practice landscapes, which is rich in information. We wanted autonomy um, to search uh, for players to search for relevant uh, affordances. So what I noticed over there was players were really trying different things. Um, they were open to new ideas. Uh, we wanted to do this uh, in terms of our pathway. We wanted to invite functionally relevant actions. So different ways of moving, different ways of doing things on the pitch. Um, this is just something that we organisationally were working off. So we would try and meet regularly and talk about our vision and our future intentions. Uh, and that was done on a regular basis. It wasn't done um, through formal meetings which were scheduled. It just happened informally. And we'd share that knowledge and beliefs about what we thought the vision of, of the player would look like representing England and how would we develop those players. And we would then reorganise the organisation that we were currently in. Just because you've got a job title and a role that does this, there's no reason why you can't do other functions as well. So we started to do a little bit of that through, through the pathway. Uh, we observed behaviours and patterns, um, and then the daily events, which is what on Keith David's timeline of microstructures, fits into that. So these are being adapted all the time. So you don't, like in about, say after a few months, start arguing about why are we designing a drill like this, why are we using markers? It's, it's already fitted into your philosophy. So it's a very dynamic process. Um, the challenge was with the coaches was to actually put some theory behind the design of what we were actually going to try and do at the under 20s, England 20s level. And that's where I sort of came in and tried to affect from the 20s um, upwards. We already had a fairly good 18s and a 16 system. We talked about, and I passed some papers around to the coaches on, on pretty much what they thought about this and how that could influence coaching where the use of inputs and outputs, coaches correcting stuff and using shared mental models. And if we looked at that, we started to make, have discussions around individuals have representations of a performance situation which is the same as their teammates. And that's the way uh, shared mental models are viewed in sport. And they're used heavily in football, rugby, and team sports, generally. Um, whenever there's um, a difference between individual performers and shared mental states, um, then 
synergy has not been achieved, which results in difficulties in coordinating on the pitch. So everybody must have that model, and it's a shared model of performance. Problems are with that is how do you actually adapt between individuals with that model when things change? There were some, and there's some other areas as well, but I've just put one up there for the moment. But what tends to happen as a result, coaching will become comparative. It's just a, a word I've coined to, to look at a coach and how they coach. They'll be comparing to something. And that comparison is, is, is all, almost expressed through their terminology and the environment it creates. People are thinking, am I doing this right or am I doing it wrong? And there's some of the environments that can happen. And you look at the way that design is around reverse and there's a fairly bit of early structuring going on. And they're sort of things that we looked out for. So there was a lot of language in the, in the pathway around clarity, detail and execution as a result of the shared mental models. before and, and somebody at the back there about intentionality and attention. So you're often thinking about the bloke you told where to stand, what's his intention? And has he affected his attention because he's not in the right position? He's probably in the right position for what he perceives that situation, but not what the coach perceives. So we do have a generation of coaches, probably who coach the way they were coached, who still are coaching some of our influential players who are coming through. So that, that is an area that, that you would look at as a sort of a limitation in a way. Um, so I passed a few papers around to, to Ian Peel, um, Nick Walsh, and then the more recent 20s World Cup coach, which is Rory Teague, and they discussed these papers. And I asked them to give me feedback on what they thought the difference was between the shared mental models approach and um, shared affordances. Okay, and you, you wouldn't be able to talk to some coaches like this, but these three blokes lapped it up. Um, Ian Peel now coaches at Saracens, he's the Forge coach. Rory T um, got invited up straight after this year to coach with Eddie Jones in the senior team. He was coaching under 16s two years earlier. Next year, World Cup under 20 winner, next year, England coach. He's gone to France at the moment. But those guys could read a paper. They were inquisitive, very curious, and they would come back with me with questions. So what are the implications for the design of practice? How do I coach? What my skill sets need to be? Well, if we look at this, now, how do you view actions from this approach? Well, they're not responses of the motor system originating in the mind or environmental stimuluses. They are adjustments of a player to a, to a context. That's what they are. Actions are adjustments to performance to context. There are means to achieving a goal, and they're just functional relationships between them and the situation that they're in. So affordances are the perception of what a thing is, i.e. space, and what it means, i.e. that space is penetrable, and they're not separate. Whereas in performance analysis, you would separate those, and you'd say there's an execution error, or something like that. Rather than perceiving space, an individual perceives the possibility for behaviour or an affordance. So moving along that, that line, shared affordances guide behaviour of groups of players. And you may have heard of these words of synergies. So in effect, there are synergies occurring on the pitch. Training tasks attune players to perceive shared affordances. So we went through all of this and summarised it, and this is what the coaches came up with. These these were the important quotes that, that came from them, not from me. Practice by manipulating constraints that can direct the player's search. 
Shared affordances inform my players how to act as a coherent unit. The teams are trained to perceive how to use and share specific affordances. That became the motto for the training session. Um, just down the bottom, if you need to do any extra research, that's, this is stuff that shows you the, the mechanism behind synergy almost. Um, dimensional compression, you'll notice in team sports there's metrics like a uh, centre of mass for a body, but you do it for the team. So it's called centroids, and you measure those, and you can look at how two teams couple each other. Um, stretch indexes and stuff like that. And then sharing patterns is, it examines how players contribute to the overall order parameter or the pattern of the way they're playing. Very interesting research on that. Uh, reciprocal compensation, which is basically how you vary to your teammates. If your teammate in a shared mental model was meant to be doing this, well, I'm doing my job, you get less co-adaptation between players. Whereas if you look at it this way, you will get compensatory variability. You're compensating for each other in a dynamic system. And the last one is degeneracy. Shared theory guides training. I love this. And we try to look at this at designing match relevant affordances in our training and promote action fidelity. So action emerged. It was a disposition in the environment and from the player. Task goals were achieved in different degrees. So, I, this is busy. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this now, but these I ask the coaches to consider intention and attention. So intentionality in players, and how to guide their attention during practice. We looked at designing practices that invited players to act. We wanted to create an urgency within players to feel they needed to act in a certain way to be more skillful. We therefore guided them onto information which helped them regulate their actions. We varied the problems all the time. We made the problem bigger or smaller, and our philosophy of training was, if you're going to train the attack, you don't work with the attack, you work with the defence. And the defence will train your attack. Uh, and once the defence becomes good, your attack has to be good. And then your attack's good, your defence becomes good, and you get this co-adaptation within the system itself. So you've got a co-coach, you've got two or three coaches uh, together. Okay. Um, another triangle. Another triangle. I first was introduced to this in the sort of mid-90s and then lucky enough to come over and meet Keith and it was really a turning point for me in terms of my, um, my sort of interaction with sport, I guess. And looking at this, I started to sort of see the affordances that were generated through the interaction of constraints. And why would Danny Carter be anybody, any different to anybody else? in terms of the affordances he selects and creates. With those affordances, at that bottom end there, you've got the player and you've got the environment. And here, in ecological dynamics, you've got some researchers who focus down this end and put an emphasis on the player imposing themselves on situations, probably more so than I'd say other researchers who sit more at the environmental end and they place a heavy emphasis on stimuluses. So a lot of the drills say yesterday are reactionary off stimuluses, which is okay to a degree, but it's not the be all and end all. And if you're gonna hover around the middle area, I really like this area. And that's where we get the shared affordances can actually invite behavior. They're not just action possibilities, they will invite you. They will invite you, there's a space over here, come and get me. And you're like, I have to make a decision here. Um, there, will be, there will be energy that's exchanged and you've got inf different information sources on the pitch. Let's just call it one, two, three. Here, there is a big invitation from the environment that's saying, come here, I'm gonna be, I'm going to afford you an opportunity to go forward in school. And that outweighs the, the player in position to want to act. So here it's evenly weighted. So they may go to information source one. Not only possibilities for action, but can also invite behavior. Players modulate this. In practice, it's all about modulating this. So a way a coach speaks to a player 
It was how come you did that? What made you want to do that? And uh, so the whole language you use, the questioning approach, uh, there's a theory behind that, and it would probably follow this for us in the 20s. Uh, practice involves learning to influence to what extent he or she is influenced by the different invitations. Okay, we probably can talk about this in the, in the smaller two groups after, hopefully, if we have time. But I just want to ja jump to the, I'm not sure this is going to play because it, it wasn't set up on instant play, but this is the result. And I know I put all the best bits together, but this is probably a result of what happened. No white! So Malinda quickly flicking it through the fingers. Here's Johnny Williams. Williams so tight. after the World Cup in Manchester and the feedback was they were very unfamiliar with playing like this. They were playing by numbers on the first phase and structure and after the first phase had finished they played what's called feel. Many players mentioned, I don't know, we just felt it should have gone right, it should have gone left. And that was the main feedback and they started to feel very relaxed playing on feel not on where they should go, where they were intended to go. And that was the main feedback from the sports psychologist. And they started to feel very good like that after about the second match in the World Cup. And then from then on it just took off. What we used, they got this diagram as players, slightly different language, but up here we've got different sorts of action. And on this continuum we've got planned action, and then we've got interaction, which is what Keith um, and um, 
Mark were talking about, and then we've got reaction, which is what we talked about earlier. And I'm just looking on this because I want to put a scale of affordances, a continuum of affordances. And I want to show that there are affordances at any point on this continuum. Here, you tend to be time independent. You have time to plan your action. It's preconceived. It gives our players an element of certainty. And it does tend to have roles and responsibilities. And they do create affordances and opportunities. The second one there is interaction. That's in the moment. And that's where you may hear some terminology called meta-stability, but that's where you interact and information is created. With that information, it's so rich. The All Blacks use that. There's not a lot of talking in the games of the All Blacks. They're quiet. <coughs> Who communicates in, in, in sort of New Zealand rugby? How do you communicate? You, you look at the opposition. And it's very quick. It doesn't take long. And through that interaction with them, and you move, they move, it creates information, and you can explore that information, you can move off it, and then you can exploit it. Effectivity. Uh, the reaction is slightly after the moment, that's time lag, slightly after the moment. You tend to be chasing the game, you'll be reacting off something. And that's not a bad thing, so you may have created the opportunity, you therefore take it. Okay, just moving slightly away from that, just show a little video clip. If on the left hand side you're in the planned action, I see the red extends out there. You could put a percentage on that, it's quite arbitrary. Okay, ball gets passed out. It should have gone to one of those three runners. Slightly bad pass. Yeah, but we'll talk about this after the clip, and it goes on to another clip now. Okay, passes the ball to space, support. He thought he had support with him because there was a space, and the ball's dropped. Where's that guy living on that continuum? Where would you say? Is he on the left, middle, right? Yeah, far left. He's way stuck down there. What's he doing? What's his role and responsibility, do you think? To organise, yeah, for when? Yeah, in about five seconds' time. So he's living in the future. Uh, whereas you've got him, he wanted to go forward and support him and he suddenly stopped. This has happened in schoolboy rugby like you wouldn't believe. Not even at this level, at the micro level, where people are in and out, they're not in the moment all the time because they've had so much explicit knowledge given passed down by the coach. They're not experiencing the moment of actually just playing. And so this is something that, that I feel quite passionate about and, 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 and brought this clip to show the coaches. Can we turn it up slightly, please? Well, once again, it's just predictable from the reds, you know. It's a good run initially there from Hendrick Choi. And then just around the corner, one off runners, easy, easy, Friday. It's a pretty good save for the biggest stat. So we agree with you. Just look too pre planned and then they didn't change and adapt to what was going on in front of them. It was easily readable and easily defensible. Okay, so the New Zealand teams have set the benchmark. They're adapting quicker than anybody else. If you copy them, you run the risk of being a reactionary team and you'll always be behind. So there's no point copying them either. <laughs> um, so look at that middle area here, which is the interaction area. Uh, we coined it um, the adaptive zone. This is where you can train in the interaction zone, where you create information and affordances can emerge. Here, this is where you explore, discover and exploit. They've checked out the defence, looking at their positioning. He's moved to see what they do, they've reacted off it. Those are deliberate movements to see what happens. They've kept the space. It's purely intention to support space. And a 
a bit of a bug pass to finish. <laughs> Look at Richie, he's pissed. With that. <laughs> so, I, I sort of like played this little clip to, the, to, to Rory Teed in the 20s and just said, Look, you know, just take a look at this little clip, this little boy. And, and just think, what, what's he doing with the toy? He's falling over, he's had a few accidents, a few mistakes. Okay, well I'm drawing analogies here with, he's got the toy, he's exploring it, he's, he's discovered some new toys. What's he actually using it for to go forward? It's a toy for him to move forward. He's not practicing cycling per se, he's implicitly, I mean these things are stabilizers these days. If you just get a kid who has an intention to want to go forward and explore, they will propel themselves on those bikes with no pedals on and they can learn to cycle in that way. Provided you create and design an environment where there's an intention to draw attention to, towards something. So he's using it to propel forward and explore the toys. What can that afford him? That toy is affording him lots of beautiful other toys on the shelves, which are colourful and quite exciting. That's what's happening. What difference there is, is there between that and a 242 or a 433 or a play or a pattern and sequence? Why can't we introduce? systems and structures as a toy for them to take into the interaction zone and adapt them. And they come up with the affordances themselves rather than us to coach them comparatively on how to do those things. And I don't think those should be introduced very early on at all, to be honest, because they're doing them anyway without themselves really knowing. They just haven't got a name. So, that, that's what I just wanted to throw up there. And the affordance was stretched. That's a landscape of affordances. The principles of any dynamic systems are very important. We've got the principles of movements and the principles of play in a team sport. Go forward, support, continuity and pressure. And we've re-emphasized these again in the last four years. So the England 20s team had this diagram. That's all they had for the World Cup. <laughs> You think about most teams would have a playbook with hundreds of arrows in and set plays. They didn't. That's all they had. And they won a World Cup with double the number more tries than we've ever scored before. Because the affordance landscape was empty to start with. That, that's what I believe anyway in, in terms of what I think happened. This is training session. Players. Oh. To look at their strategies. 
when you look at them. Yes. So the players will pick it up immediately. So when these two guys go in the middle, they may do something different and work off that. So they're learning on the sideline. They're going, just tell the coaches what you're seeing, fellas. Okay, stop there. Why do you think, I want to ask the players, I'm not going to make you uncomfortable, why do you think that might be? Why guys, you're scoring well, a different try line, isn't it? Why, why are you running back to another try line, do you think? They want time. They want time to organise. If I said, okay, get in the middle. You've got 10 seconds to score as many trucks as you can any way you like. Oh, no, score! And score, go, and score, go! See? They go back to habits. Go that way, go that way. But they're meant to score as many tries as they can in 10 seconds. It's habits. You're trying to break those, those habits. If you think you can beat it in the middle, you've just got two. It doesn't happen the first time. It looks messy. It's very uncomfortable for coaches to watch. I'm on their case now, but they'll change. Two, Finally. It's it's three, You've got to go intention, forward, forward, score. had in the 20s uh, hotel was two whiteboards in the um, performance analysis room and it wasn't called performance. What we had in there was a beanbags and a table tennis table. We took away all the seriousness. We wanted players to come home to the hotel and enjoy themselves and the first room they go into was beanbags and a table tennis table and two whiteboards. And on one of the whiteboards was missed opportunities and taking opportunities for training sessions and for matches. And the players would come up and they would mark all the ones that were missed in the training and they would go and watch them on the video and all the ones they thought were really good that they took and how could they improve on those for the match on the weekend. And that was literally all they had. The players would write it up and the players would wipe it off. Um, and they could only wipe it off if something better was going to get thrown up there. So essentially that was literally all they had and we found that um, as a result of that um, the players interacted and came up with their own things. One of the things I wanted to show you here was structure where we turn that plays, patterns and sequences would invariably be about 60% of the training sessions traditionally. We minimised it to about 3%. We were worried that wasn't going to be enough of it in there. And what we did was we didn't allow anyone to pre-plan any plays at all until they got to training. And halfway through training, it was about 20 minutes into training, they were already fatigued, and we'd say, right, you've got five minutes to run some first phase plays from lineouts and scrums. And they were so tired, they'd walk over there and think, Christ, we've just played 30 minutes, we need some plays off this, 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 and this. So it was actually quite relevant to what they'd just done thinking we need some plays to do this, this and this. And they only have five minutes. So what does a player do? They cut through all the noise and they pick out the most relevant information that they need to design a pre-planned move. And then they bring it, and we say you've got two minutes back into the game now, 12 on 12. And, they, and then every now and then after that, the coach may say, right, play from the line out, play from the scrum, and now they've got their chance to run the structure. But after that, it's straight back into the game. And so we're breaking habits takes time and you need support from your whole coaching group, including medical support staff, because you need to use the same language. Generally, um, from this approach, traditionally you would start from this end and you would start the game with this, so there's order um, and people know what they're doing. And then you may go into this element of play with a little bit of shape and connection. And then you end up playing a game at the end of training. That generally would be the learning approach for a team type game. What happens is when they get to this movement end here, shit, the ball's in space, a little bit chaotic, what do we do? 
I need, a, I, I need to get some organisation. Let's shoot back into shape. So you hear talk players talking about shape, formations, get into shape, get into depth. And then if they can't do that, let's, let's go for a ruck and a maul. Let's get some organisation off what I call landmarks, fixed, static landmarks. Those landmarks change. If you go down to here, you would shoot to different information. It's moving dynamic information. And we wanted our players to be able to attune, perceive and act in movement. So with young kids, you should start off down here, like Mark was saying, and play all your sport in movement. If you can coordinate and move, there's a high possibility in my experience you can do these things later on. Okay, I just wanted to move to that, because um, I'm aware of time, and just finish off now with um, a sailing um, project that I did back in Australia. When, as a skill acquisition specialist, you sort of sit in your office and then you get a phone call, can you help us with sailing? Yeah, no worries. Right. <laughs> okay. In the next three years, I spent in a boat in Sydney Harbour, picturing myself going, oh, yeah, I've done something right in my life, and just <laughs> popping around in the speedboat. But I didn't know the like, first thing about sailing. I didn't know you couldn't actually sail a boat directly into the wind. <laughs> and the Olympic coach goes, by the way, Rick, you can't actually sail into the wind, mate. Oh, right yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, mate. But there's a space here that you can't sail into that calls no sailing zone because the, the boat doesn't go anywhere. You need to be on a certain angle. So literally, the boat's trying to navigate around here to go forward to get to a marker. Okay, so yeah, that's sailing to me now, so I understood sailing. But a really good thing leading up to the Olympic Games in London, I was with the Olympic sailors, and they got three... Uh, gold medals and one silver out of four, co four competitors. The most successful com um, competitive uh, um, team environment in Australian sport. The head coach was Ukrainian, Viktor Kovalenko. The first thing he said to me was, Rick, I want you to go in here and, and, and just have a look. This boat is going to win in London. I'm like, really? Yeah, but the only thing slow in town is, is these two sailors. <laughs> <laughs> It was brilliant, absolutely bloody brilliant. And I thought, shit, I'd think about that in rugby. My team, our team, can score as many tries as we want. The only thing that slows us down is the coach. He's putting all this bloody rubbish in place. It's so true. Young kids could score. If you put two defenders in front of them and there's eight young players, they'll score, 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 score. And then you put extra defenders in. And then they start to attend to, well, we might need a play here. So really, they came up with this figure eight. And we do a lot of figure eights in training. And I thought, well, oh, that's interesting. And I'll just show you what, it, what, what a little clip is when you do this. So what it is, is you've got lots of, you won't see it in many countries, but what they do in Australia is just they put all the classes together. You've got windsurfers, you've got lasers, you've got other boats, and they all go, Jesus, they're all looking out for each other. So they all go at different speeds. Whereas in more organised environments, they're all similar boats, but not over there. So it's mass chaos. It's absolutely brilliant. And they're doing these figure outs. So in effect, what actually happens is the wind's coming down, and you've got to try and make your way around the marker and then get back here. And it's a bit of a race. We kind of had this idea, Emmett Lazic and me, that let's use ecological dynamics here because we want better turning and we want better trajectories because we want to save time. We kind of had this idea that we've got a tide. Why don't we pull up the anchor of one of the boat, of one of the boys, and just let it flow? Some of the best ideas you can ever have are just like, yeah, let's try and do that. But we won't tell the sailors. So when the sailors are heading that way, we'll pull the anchor up quickly and throw it back in. <laughs> you do that in rugby. You know the old Auckland Brits? Put four markers down. And when they do a drill around the four markers, as they're doing it, just go around and pick up the markers. They won't even notice. 
It's like the gorilla clip. Pull your trousers down, they won't even notice. <laughs> Just walk, walk around, pick up markers. And the players who are not good with spatial orientation, they won't know where to gravitate to. They'll actually, the square will turn into a circle and move down the pitch. But you'll get your good players. And then, as they get around to the corner, they'll start using the other reference points and they try and keep the shape. But I'm going off tangent. So this mark is moving. What does it do? What does it do from an ecological point of view? Well, coordination dynamics is what we use to figure out. And from this, as the sailors start going around this marker, they move down here, there is information that they need to couple to their actions from the starboard marker. So they're using this movement, this relative displacement, to help control as they go around here. But they're not sure yet, because they're not sure that the marker's even moving. So they're not using any of this at this moment in time. When it is moving, and when they find out it is moving, they start to deviate their angles around here and their approach lines. Because as they're coming down here, we spoke to them in the boats. And the, the, the number one and three in the world will go, you've lifted the anchor, haven't you? The number 56 in the world and all the other sailors have no real idea. They are so attuned, the good sailors, as they're coming around this marker, they realise something was up. The next time they came around, what happened? <coughs> this is perceiving information. I've put a little line here. As that's moving, the good sailors started to about here, started to look where the marker was. As they got to about here, and they started to deviate as they were coming in, and they changed their angles and got away earlier. Other bikes were doing out here. So the, what I call this is just the strength of the perception action coupling. It's weak here and then it starts to strengthen. So I just wanted to show you that is, is the strength of perception action coupling. And the last one here is the potential form of, uh, performance rate limiter being relatively large. So the boats who weren't scanning this marker would make a huge adjustment. That, that's literally 10, 15 seconds off the time. Gold medal, gone. What's decision making? What are your actions? They are adjustments to the moments of the interactions. So you need continual adjustments all the way. You don't need big adjustments in sport. They're the people who, who are making those mistakes because they're not perceiving and tuning into the relevant information. So we muck with the marker. So gradually they start to tune into it. We use cameras on the head to check where they're scanning. I'll flip that on a bit. Right, so drifting markers facilitate tuning effectively uh, the potential control parameter. So that's a potential control parameter. What can we do with that? Well, as they're coming into the boat here, what information can they use? They can also use other boats in front of them. So what we found through the camera was they were realizing that these boats here were changing their exit lines here. And so as a result of that, they would change the way they went in because they would knew that this had moved behind them. So they were using other sources of information as well to specify actions. What we thought was, okay, when they're going around this marker here, let's play with the boy again. Sorry, that was um, to validate it. Um, we did some... Um, Eye tracking. Not happy. Anyway, look, I'll, I'll flip that on. But what we had was this great idea again. Let's let's bugger with the marker. When they're going around this way, we'll move it ten meters closer. What is that to the strength of the perception action coupling now? Yeah. They can't let go of this now. They're monitoring everything. It's so intense going around here. What happens when the tide's really high and it's strong, that marker moves real quick. Okay, so you can only do it till about this point here, and then you've got to pick the marker up. So what that showed us was what are the variables we can manipulate in the environment that we can constrain to improve perception, action, and decision making. And I really like this type of research. It was all applied, it was all in field. Um, and it involved the sailors as well. So I really love this sort of stuff. One of the things that came out at the end was 
working with Viktor Kovalenko, he was all about reducing complexity. He loved order parameters because it reduced complexity. Everything came in threes. He said, Rick, don't give me anything less is less than three. Um, his risk taking, uh, I'll probably talk about that in the small groups, but what his big thing was decision making in the boats. What he, what he didn't want was big adjustments. He wanted online regulation, which is something I picked up from Keith years ago, where online regulation to me was stay online and athlete, stay in the moment, keep regulating off information, make a decision which information you're going to use to regulate yourself, and I'll help you do that as a coach. So you've got loads of boats trying to make it to the top market. Who's going to win? Well, this is a boat that I'm interested in. They pick their line. They may have to turn at some stage to make it around. But what's happening? <coughs> He's tuning in to the marker, and suddenly there's a boat threatening him from behind. They become what we call information coupled. That boat is more concerned with him being a threat. <coughs> so what actually happens when there's a wind gust just over here? And these sailors pick it up and they all start heading that way. He carries on. He misses the opportunity. That's called an affordance that wins you Olympic medals. They come along every now and then and you've got to be able to perceive them in the distance. Your best sailors can sense wind drifts very quickly. They're contextually different on the surface and they start to feel a breeze on their face. And what they do is they turn the boat and they have a sense for where it's coming. We've used the eye scanners uh, for that before. We, we, we know it happens. This boat continues on because he's in a duel now with him. And this has overtaken this opportunity here and that's bad decision making. So what we do in training is we try and encourage and trip them up. So what we actually will do is we will select two or three boats and they will annoy the other boats. And they try and create these duels in training and try to get them off track. And there were some of the things that we explored and tried in the Olympic Games and, and it was very successful. Um, and the sailors would basically wait to get tripped up at every training session. And that was, they had fun doing it. And they were tripping each other else up and helping each other. And, and so yeah, it was one of those environments where it was very creative and, and very exploratory. Final few slides. Um, he won gold in um, Tom Slingsby in Bournemouth in London. I, we wanted to look at why are these sailors so skillful? We did a um, history developmental questionnaire, and what came through, they spent years as young kids sailing in a minimum of four different boats. They all sailed in four different boats, and they used to sit on a cliff at Sydney Harbour and look at all the sea, and look at the sea changes and the weather changes. And as a result of that, they, they love to enjoy playing games in the boats. So what he's doing here is he's jumped out of the boat and he's basically seeing if he can stand on the boat for as long as possible. <coughs> From an information point of view, what's actually that doing to his coordination? It's amplifying the problem. If you sit in the boat, your centre of mass is lower down, it's easier, it's more stable. He loves to stand up in his boats. This is his training session. No one can tell him you can't do this. He's heading out in the middle of 25 knot wind, which is pretty dangerous, <laughs> and he does this. What you're doing is, what's his variables he can vary? He's trying to control that in relation to that, which is the centre of mass of the boat. What can he play around with? He can vary the boat roll with his left and his right foot to coordinate it with these. <coughs> so there are fixed and varied variables that he's in control of now. He has got additional degrees of freedom to help him control, which is pitch, your trim, tiller, and rudder. What he does though is he tries to freeze these. He will freeze these degrees of freedom, and then he will co-vary this with this with, with the roll.
Look at that cheeky grin. You couldn't, you couldn't wipe that off his face. These guys love what they do. Why? Because I reckon there's 100% fun and enjoyment in everything these guys do and girls do. When, you've, when you enjoy what you do, you learn. You've got motivation to want to get back out there. Absolutely, 100%. I pick this up and I put it in everything I do now with the coaches. They're motivated to practice and they practice on the edge. They're not happy unless they're practicing on the edge where it's uncertain what exactly is going to happen. And this is the last slide. When you're coming home at the end of a training session, the speedboat, like I was in the speedboat just filming behind, you see you've got a wake behind you, they can surf the wake. And there's about six boats at the end of training. And there's a consequence. If you stay on that wake as long as possible, what happens? You get a free ride home. If you fall off the wake, see you later, they make it back to the clubhouse about an hour and a half after you. <laughs> so what's the competition? Stay on the bloody wake. Here's the last one. The prize is it gets a free ride home. The other boats are around the other side of the cliff. And they're having to sail home. <laughs> That was a tough day at the office for me, that was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it. I've, I've finished now. I'll leave you. Okay, so again, thanks again to this morning to Rick, Zoe, and Keith for their for their um, really really insightful um, talks this morning. So, questions. We've got about 10 minutes for questions. Yes.
title is a means to an end. It's a means to get all that. You don't often have to tackle people. You can actually just get them all back to our grouping of them. Okay? So there's ways to actually tackle the get once they start to merge. So you can try and constrain the uh, interaction in a way that you can take them in Whereas um, somewhat easier to try and get all back. But we, I wouldn't look at any tackle technique practice. Um, I think traditionally the way it's done at the moment is it's just done in a quite a, quite a technical procedural way. And I think what tends to happen, and, and I know that um, Stuart's been part of us uh, with a similar point of viewpoint, is that what happens is you've got a, the outcome being the uh, reaction or the technique rather than actually getting the ball back. So players are going in with a textbook tackle. And the, the, the attacker moves, and I bang my head. I get injury because I'm not adjusting my or regulating my actions to the situation at the moment. So we're getting concussions, we're getting young kids going in, and not adjusting their body positions because they've been taught an isolated tackle technique. In football, you probably don't get these, these accidents as well in rugby. The lot of coaches who don't like collisions and they get to skill. So now there's a primacy on uh, an emphasis on tackling. Whereas you shouldn't have to really do that. Um, so for me, I would be more very busy into a small side game where you take away these, the, the consequence of getting injured, where it's more shoulder on, and you can avoid getting shoulder on somebody as you're walking speed. And from that, you will emerge, or the tackling action will emerge from those scenarios, and you just therefore alleviate your ability and the pressure.
satisfied in some way, that he's put them in a good position to respond now. They found something out about themselves, particularly fatigue before the World Cup. Fatigue them to see how they can get through six nations with not many tactics, with just very little. And they found a lot of about themselves. How else would you ever find that out? Yeah, you could win it. Is that working? Um, as has been the theme here for the last few days, uh, for me, coaching is complicated, people are complex, and the elite <laughs> sports environment is very dynamic, it's changing, it's very nimble. Um, so, Rick and I, as Rick suggests, you know, we're consultants, and our job is to provide um, a consultancy service whereby coaches and the lead coach can utilize our information in the way he <laughs> feels is best. And Eddie Jones has a rich history of coaching and he's going to utilize some of the things we say. He's going to uh, put, put to the side some of the things we say. Um, but the reality is when you work in a complex environment or a complicated environment, you know, whether for me it's in rugby or AFC Bournemouth, you're, you're going to agree with some things that the leader does and you're going to disagree with some things that the leader does. But ultimately, you, you have to be a great follower. You know, we talk about leadership and coaching. What about followership? You know, Rick and I have to be great followers. And so we have to look at what, in terms of nimbleness, we have to look at what Eddie wants. He's our leader. And we have to provide our information so that he can utilise it in, in the best way possible for our environment. Um, the last thing I'd say is, you're always striving to win in the elite environment. We're striving to win, but doing so with the mission in mind. And I would say that ultimately, you're trying to be double vision. We've got the World Cup coming up, and um, we have that in mind. So we're striving to win, but sometimes striving to, to win um, it, it doesn't happen because you've got that secondary vision of the, of, of the dis, distant future. Um, but in terms of, I'm here as a sports psychologist and listening to Zoe, to uh, Rick, to Keith, I'm learning this stuff and um, working alongside Rick at, at England Rugby. As somebody who's grown up initially playing professional golf in a very information processing manner, Boy, I wish that I had been exposed to some of this stuff. I wouldn't have won much money, but I would have won a bit more. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's how it ought to be. That's definitely what I would expect. Again, people like me, who are classy and so, that he does with dynamics and not native pedagogy, all of that space, I think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not alone as being somebody who would have to defend incredibly. Okay, I've just had the signal that time's up and we need to go to lunch. Yes, he's waving at me furiously. Okay, uh, again, thanks again to our speakers this morning. Round of applause.